believe we are ready to go. So howdy folks. Thank you for joining this Coffee Technicians Guild Ask the Expert. This is episode 14, Water and Specialty Coffee Part 2 with Scott Manley of La Marzocco yet again. Scott's going to review what we've talked about so far, and we're going to leave plenty of space for questions at the end this time. So please keep popping them into the questions box. We'll keep tabulating them. Um, anything we're not able to answer, because I'm sure there'll be a lot, we'll make sure we address somewhere on CDG social media platforms. But we've got your contact info. So if there's something particularly pressing, uh, we'll get back to you. Um, quick reminder, this Ask the Expert series is for everybody. So please join us every Friday at this time. Next week, we'll be discussing what text should know about coffee with Caleb Leach and Marty Rowe. And a full schedule is available on the CTG website if you want to plan ahead. Um, but time to hand things over to Scott. Uh, go ahead and take it away, Scott. Hey, everybody. How is everybody out there this uh, fine Friday morning? I'm sitting on some fresh snow and some cold weather. Um, just uh, jumping into this, and before I start moving slides, I, I just want to say thanks to the SCA for this opportunity uh, this morning as I was uh, reviewing notes and, and, and just kind of seeing where we're at with things. I, I, I thought back, and I, I've been an SCA member, or at least worked with an SCA member company since like 1993. So this organization's been there for a lot of my career. And so honestly, to see where we're at today is it's pretty amazing how far it's it's grown and how 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 developed it's become. So uh excited for that. Um oops. And somewhere in here. It will focus. There we go. So uh as uh, the introduction said, my name's Scott Manley. I'm the technical support supervisor and water quality specialist at Walmart Zoka USA. And uh, so uh, introductions, uh, I'd like to thank my employer for uh, have providing this opportunity to, you know, have me be here and, and, and support uh, all of you. And a uh, shameless plug for my own water uh, quality uh, website that's not yet up yet, but it's getting there. Um, jumping into it. So this is basically a review of where we've come so far this year in the webinar series and in the Ask the Expert series. So we're just gonna go through a couple of the past episodes and kind of see where we're at and then bring in some kind of new information and topics at the end about where we're gonna take this series and where it's gonna go. So I really appreciate you all being here. I know we're all here at different uh, times of the, the day for us. I'm, it's 8 a.m. in the morning here, but I know there's people that are probably, it's the middle of the night. So I, I really appreciate this. So episode one. So when we started this, uh, they, uh, Highland had me go first in this series, and so we jumped right into probably the first tool or the primary tool that most technicians are probably going to be using. It's, I know it's the first tool I was given as a technician the first time I was told to go out and test water. Here's a TDS meter. Not here's how it works or here's how water quality is. Here's a TDS meter. Go use it. And so from that, we developed this episode of things that I've learned over the past two decades and kind of jumped into well, what is a TDS meter and what does it do? Um, so we covered a bunch of topics and I kind of listed them out here. Uh, you know, what's TDS, total dissolved solids. What is a TDS meter and how does it work? Um, how do I use one? Uh, how do I use the results? I mean, what do I do with it? So I've tested the water, what do I do? Um, we talked about it's the sum of total, the sum of dissolved solid and lights in water. We also talked about what kind of TDS meter you want and what kind of TDS meter you don't want because they are made for different uh, applications. Um, the most common of which is usually for aquariums and salt water. We know we don't want those. We want fresh water because that's what we're dealing with, uh, with espresso. We also talked about the importance of TDS in terms of what is the information we're gathering and how do we apply it and what is it good for and what is it not good for? Um, I kind of put that in, in this heading of TDS is everything and meaningless at the same time, because usually uh, that's where my conversations with customers go. It's either the be all and end all number that they're shooting for without any idea of what it represents, or on the flip side, I will hear from coffee professionals that tell me it's completely meaningless. 
So as a technician, we know that the truth of that lies somewhere in between, and we kind of we went through that. Um, and then we did a little bit of review of tools uh, and, and and a bunch of other stuff. So that was kind of the first episode. I muddled through it. I had terrible slides. Matter of fact, I didn't even know the slides were going to be on showing on the screen. Uh, so that was my surprise. I just did them for my own notes. So you know. Um, but I got good feedback, and 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 you know, I, I think we we did okay. Jumping into what was then episode six, probably the thing that we as technicians deal with the most uh, is water hardness. Um, we we want some water, you know, some hardness in our water for extraction, but uh, we don't want so much that we're out there, you know, clogging up our machines. And as we know, that's the, you know. As we say, it's 70% uh, of our service calls are water related and most of that's due to hard water. In that episode, we covered a number of things related to hard water, not only identifying what hard water is, but what it isn't and what it does. Um, so the two main components of water hardness, the two main analytes that we test for are calcium and magnesium. And generally we look at what we're looking for is total hardness. While we can look at the constituent analytes of individual calcium and magnesium ions, total hardness is really what's telling us what's gonna scale in our boiler. That's the actually top line number that we need to use to assess water quality as it relates to brewing extraction and machine health. Um, we also talked about what happens if you don't treat your water, right? Which is something we as technicians all deal with. Uh, customers, uh, you know, routinely tell us that they they have water filters, uh, and yet you're still there cleaning out their machine. Um, so it does it does result in a lot of service calls. It's the majority of probably what we deal with uh, in terms of of uh, water and espresso. Um, and so we talked about those impacts. Um, we also talked about the types of hardness: temporary hardness versus permanent hardness, um, and and how that those two things are similar but chemically different and how each one has its own unique effect on water and on the equipment we also talked about testing tools and this gets a little more complex in, in episode six than in episode one we were dealing with one tool only tds and one number and while we're still only dealing with one analyte with calcium we're, we got a couple of options and strategies about how we can go about testing and quantifying uh, water hardness. So we went in depth in that. And from there, went into our next subject at episode 10, which is chlorides. Now, purposely, I left out chloramines. I, I actually didn't write the title. Uh, but um, but they while they sound similar, they're actually two different substances, and you really deal with them differently because they present two different problems. So with chlorides, we're kind of working on the opposite side of hardness in a sense you know the primary thing we deal with the technicians water hardness and scaling nuisance calls clogging cleaning out boilers that sort of thing the flip side of that is corrosion and that's where we talk about you know the damage that can happen and that's really permanent stuff that's the stuff we really want to avoid at all costs and so we looked at well what is chloride um, and what it's not um, and how to identify it and so the big the 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 takeaways that we had from that episode um, is that it causes corrosion in stainless steel, copper, and brass. Um, that in low concentrations, it will actually improve the palatability of water, and will possibly mask roasting defects. So it's a twofold thing to want to remove chloride from water. Not only you're protecting the equipment, but you're also uh, improving the quality of water for extraction because you're removing something that can actually hinder the true extraction of coffee. Um, so we also talked about where you're going to encounter chlorides and, and what kind of water and places and geography that's more likely to encounter that, which tends to be coastal, although not always or exclusively, and in parts of the upper Midwest of the US. We didn't cover other geographies around the world, and that's something I would, I think, at some point is worthy of an episode of talking about how we treat water in different parts of the world because we have, you, know, you can have unique challenges depending on where you're at. We also talked about the SCA standards for um, 
chloride concentration, as well as various manufacturers, including La Marzocco standard for chloride. And as we see, more and more equipment manufacturers employ stainless steel in espresso machines. This is going to be more, uh, obviously, a bigger consideration uh, as we see new gear coming into the market. So, with a review of those past three episodes, and I know that was rather brief, so if you have the opportunity to, please go onto YouTube and, and or onto the you know Copy Technicians Guild website and get those links to those previous episodes and, and, and kind of go back and review or see them for the first time and tell me what you think. And because this is a review of those, we're also gonna, we're gonna throw in a little bit of information about where we're gonna go with this series and, and kind of topics that we're gonna cover. We're gonna today briefly touch on one of those, which is documentation and communication. So when we gather information, um, when we test water while we're on site, uh, what do we do with that information? And so what I, what I would propose, and this is coming from my own experience, is that the first thing you wanna do is make it a part of your tech work. Meaning just like you would start to fill out a document or say hello to a customer or you know, maybe dial in the espresso is the last thing you do after repairing an espresso machine, make testing the water at whatever level that is or needs to be a part of every single uh, visit or action that you have, interaction with a customer. And that helps you develop good habits. And so with that, you want to make sure that you're including that in your documentation somewhere. Uh, earlier on, early on, I used to just write it in like the comment section. And then at some point I, I actually changed my form to have a section in there. So I'd have like, I'd have something that identifies the customer, identifies the piece of equipment I'm working with and the reported issue, the resolution, the parts I used, the time that it took for, you know, so I could do, you know, billing and reporting. And then additionally in there, I'd have a line that had water quality. And it started out with something simple like, TDS before and after filter because most of my customers had some some form of RO or nano filtration for hardness uh, and then later um, as I learned more about water quality and how to test for it and became comfortable with the results I was getting I added in like water hardness and alkalinity and so this is something that as you record this information and document it and 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 review it uh, it's something that you can then communicate with your customers. Not only can you talk about, hey, uh, you know, we, you know, this time when we visited and we, you know, cleaned out the restrictor in your machine, you know, here's your water quality as it stands. This is a contributing factor. You know, it is something we need, you want to address. Uh, but having that conversation at, you know, a single point in time is is powerful. It's even more powerful if you can go back and say, hey, you know, we went back and reviewed our last preventative maintenance visits or service calls. And we're just kind of tracking your water and we've noticed that it's, you know, changed. You know, maybe it's, you need to address uh, how you're dealing with that. It's also just good to know if you're the one responsible for maintaining a water system for a cafe, that you have some, you know, some concrete information that you can supply to your customer to reassure them that you're on top of it, that you know what you're, what you're talking about. So, um other things with that, become a subject matter expert. Learn as much as you can. Be curious and be approachable. And uh, don't be afraid to ask questions and reach out. That's where I got. I just plowed forward with this when I was a much younger person and made a lot of mistakes. But in that, I learned a lot and I just kept going. You know, have tenacity. Uh, water is a very complex subject, much like electricity. Nobody can, you can't see it. You can't really, you know, um, if you can see your water, that's a problem, but and sometimes you can. But uh, but uh, I've had that a few times. Um, but most often than not, it's, it's sort of, uh, uh, it's almost conceptual. Like you really have to learn some, some new communication skills in how you relate uh, water for customers, um, you know. Jokingly, I put on there, it's also okay to pretend you're on a smoke break and go outside to the car in the parking lot and call somebody and ask them. And then when you walk back inside, you can say, hey, you know, I went out, had a smoke or whatever. Don't have a drink. Um, but I thought about it and uh, I think I know what the answer is. And you look like a pro, man. That's the thing. And, you know, whatever it takes, um, you know, reach out and, uh, you know, all of us are behind you in the guild. 
and and there's a lot of uh, great resources and people out there with experience. So you know, if you've had that burning question and you haven't had an answer, then you know you don't have a somebody immediately around you. Please reach out on the on the Slack channel, throw it into the the water Slack channel, and and uh, post up your questions. You know, that's that's how we we find things out. That's how we discover. So, um. Also want to put a plug in next week. There's a ASD application. That's kind of the next thing that's coming up. It's not part of this webinar series, but it is a live webinar series uh, for the new copy technicians uh, program. I was asked to make sure we include some upcoming events in that. And then we'll also have kind of a, you know, the new season of Ask the Expert and some of those topics coming out soon shortly as well. That was kind of my brief wrap-up presentation review of the last three episodes and, and a brief talk on just, you know, where we're at with, uh, you know, documentation and communication. And, and, and I think that can be something that could take up a whole, you know, 15 minutes down the road or 20 minutes. And that's something we'll probably plan for. But right now, let's take some, some questions and, uh, and open it up for people and uh, go from there. Hey Clinton, before we start questions, you want to explain the um, Scott? You got my email wrong again. You want to yeah. explain the Slack channel to the viewers? Yeah, apologies if there's a little feedback noise. Uh, shared space and there's a vacuum that just started up. But um, the Coffee Technicians Guild, as part of membership, we have a Slack, um, which is an online kind of productivity tool. If you haven't used it for something else before. Um, and within the CTG Slack, we have all different channels based on question and answer for technician problems. Um, we've got a channel for if you're trying to hunt down a buried manual that you just can't seem to find, but you think Highland might have a copy somewhere in a filing cabinet. Um, and really it's one of the most tremendous resources that I've taken advantage of constantly as a member of the CTG. Um, so if you'd be interested in being being able to participate in that resource and you're not already a CTG member, please consider joining because it is absolutely worth it. Um, and I'm happy to answer more questions about that. If people have them, they can reach out to me directly. Can I add a story to that? Please do. I think this might've actually been you. Um, the benefit of the Slack channel is you've got over 200 texts watching it really regularly. So one night about 11 o'clock, we get a message that a tech in New York is looking for a really specific element and he could not find, was that you was that that was you wasn't it clinton it actually wasn't i think that might have been um will lahara but the point is is that within about 15 minutes we had a response from italy telling the tech who the best person in new york state to get the element from was and then promptly emailed him um mail, sent him a message on how to bridge it so it would work. It would work temporarily. So it was. It, that's the Slack's got a lot of benefits because we all religiously watch it. Oh yeah. On to you. Back to you, Flynn. Well, I mean, we're open for questions. I don't see any popped in the box quite yet. Um, please toss them in. But Highland, you usually have a few that you've uh, saved off to the side. Do you have any you can I, toss I up that we do. can toss around? Um, there are a couple in the box. Um, let's let I forgot to get, I'll go through them. Um, but let's I want to address. Um, I'm set as an organizer. So um, from Matt Nirenberg, um, his question is: How do you evaluate numerous types of filters for an espresso or other brew setup, common filter setups? I'm in Baltimore and our water is reasonable, but is slightly on the hard side. 104, 104 ppm. So I think there was two parts in that. Uh, when you say evaluating filters, I, I assume he means evaluating filters to deal with moderately or mildly hard water, you think? That, that's what it sounds like. Yeah. So, Matt, you want to jump in if that's the, and, and clarify the question? He did. Um, my question is, do you evaluate the numerous types of filters for, it's the same question. Okay, so uh, there are a number of filter, like single cartridge or multi cartridge solutions for dealing with hard water based upon a number of, of technologies, um, some of which work better than others depending on the situation you're in. So how do you evaluate that? I think that's something 
uh, worth uh, a broader discussion and an introduction for a lot of people because there are uh, I one, two, three, four or five cartridge-based solutions just for hard water that that you can that you can employ. Uh, the first one we think of, probably the oldest, is polyphosphate. Um, that was that was real common uh, 20 years ago. It's become less common because we know it doesn't work so well for espresso machines. Um, sodium sodium ion exchange, which is works just the same way as as a traditional automatic head water softener. You know those big tanks, the glass tanks with the valve and the piping all on top. Works the same way. It's just that media contained into a replaceable cartridge. Its advantage is it does remove hardness from water, doesn't affect the alkalinity. Uh, the third, probably most, probably now more common, is weak acid cation exchange. Much like sodium ion exchange, it exchanges, uh, you know, ion. It's an ion exchange form, but it's actually removing calcium and magnesium and replacing it with hydrogen in the water. Um, so it works a little bit differently. It also removes alkalinity, which the sodium ion exchange does not. It also lowers the pH of water so that the water's below its saturation point. And when you do that, the remaining calcium and magnesium in the water will not precipitate out and create scale. Also, you have low pH. Uh, and then probably the last and most recent one is, uh, goes by several names, but the, the general technology is referred to template-assisted crystallization or template-assisted nucleation. Um, works in a similar fashion if you're thinking about it, to like a polyphosphate in that it, it causes the uh, calcium to form microcrystals in the water. So it forces it to precipitate out at nucleation points in the media. And then that scale, because it's electrically bonded to itself, doesn't want to bond to other things around it. It doesn't remove anything from the water, but it does make it easier to clean out. Uh, I'm not really an expert on it. I actually had a great conversation with Marty Rowe, who's been using it. And I know uh, Alan Leibowitz, down at Pitt crew's been using it, and I know a couple other technicians that say they've had some success with it. So it's worth investigating. Um, uh, so that's kind of like the newest thing. So those are kind of like the four broad kind of categories of filters that you might use to deal with hard water and moderately hard water. I'd say if you have really hard water, uh, 10 grains or above, cartridge-based solution is just really not very efficient and not cost effective. At that point, you want a dedicated softening system of some kind. Hey, Scott, you touched on it a little bit. Um, and it was one of the questions I had was, what can you do a, a quick review of what is pH and why is it a problem? Why it could ah, be a problem? Yeah, so pH just generally, I mean, people think of it as the acidity of water, and that's sort of true. pH is power of hydrogen, and it's actually a relationship between Two, I'm going to screw this up. I'm not a chemistry major. <laughs> Basically, water is, it It does this thing called auto disassociate, meaning that the, the H2O separates out into hydroxyl and hydroxide, right, hydrogen, hydronium and hydroxide molecules. And every minute it's switching back and forth and colliding into each other. And there may or may be an imbalance in the ratio of those uh, hydronium. So if you've got more hydrogen in your water, essentially, the pH number, it's logarithmic. The lower that pH number goes, the more hydrogen you have from seven. Um, and so when you have low pH, it's not necessarily a problem for equipment in and of itself. If that's the only thing is just that the pH is low naturally in your water. That in and of itself is not a problem. However, it opens up the possibility that if you have an introduction of higher chloride or sulfate concentrations in your water, that can present a corrosion problem. Not only that, low pH water uh, or acidic water obviously is going to extract coffee differently and is more likely to have an absence of a buffer or alkalinity. And so you get a lot more brighter, sharper notes out of your extraction. So, yeah. Okay. Clinton, can you see questions or you just want me to keep reading? You're also on mute. Okay, let's do. Until we get Clinton back, um, here's a I question. We, now, yeah. Okay, let's right. do the third wave. Let's do the third wave water question because that's the one we always get. What's the third wave water question? Um, I should have those guys on. We should have those. I know guys we on. should. We actually should. Um, yeah, they're great. They're a lot of fun, actually. There was a question about the future of third wave water, and I'm not. I, I wait. Hold on. Um, 
third wave water and perfect water seem to be gaining traction yeah. in the barista world. Can you talk about the practical applications in a cafe for um, these products and products like them? Well, I, I obviously don't, you know, work for them and it's a separate company, so I don't want to speak too much on behalf of somebody, uh, but they are, uh, you know, a really unique solution in that it's a pre-dosed uh, remineralization product. So you just take distilled water or really, really super clean RO water uh, and um, or DI water and, you know, add your chemicals back in manually. It's a great solution because in a small sense or for small dosing because, hey, you know the analyte concentration. You don't have to do a lot of measurement. If you know that your water is distilled water and you add X amount of chemical concentration to it, you're going to end up with a product. It's very easy, very repeatable. And it's batch based, which is uh, a lot easier to control than say trying to pass water and control water through some sort of media to remineralize. That's a little more challenging and requires, uh, you know. So from that standpoint, you know, it's great. It's repeatable. It it can, you know, I've 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 had it. I've used it. Um, it makes, uh, you know, it does certainly, uh, imp, you know, makes consistent repeatable coffee. I think from a subjective standpoint. Um, and because I'm from Seattle, where we have to low TDS water, uh, I, I tend to favor that. You know, I mean, that's what I grew up with. Uh, and and so when I brew coffee that's, you know, a lot harder or higher co mineral concentration, I notice it, uh, you know, mostly with batch brew. Um, but I think it's a great thing because it does create, you know, this repeatable um, uh, process that's easy to understand uh, for customers. Whether or not how that looks in, in a commercial setting, you're trying to batch much larger doses of water and manage that, uh, that, that, that's a little more challenging. So it's also pretty similar to if you, if anyone's been online and looked at like five senses uh, water recipe, you know, the 70, 30 water, uh, which I think is pretty similar to several other water uh, recipes for remineralization using magnesium sulfate and sodium bicarbonate. Um, there's a few other recipes out there as well that include potassium and a few other things. But yeah, no, it's it's very interesting. Yeah, they've done really well. Uh, I've got one here that um, I like and I want to tack on to a little bit. Um, how often should I take samples to send out to a professional lab to measure in-depth water quality? And kind of tacking on to that, we talked about it, I think, last episode. Um, working with your water source to uh, understand how water's changing seasonally. Um, yeah. So I think it'd be a good chance to review on that a little bit. So let's see. Uh, in terms of using a compliance lab, one of the challenges is that um, it's kind of expensive to do on a routine basis for the most part. There are a couple of lower cost labs out there, but they're, you know, usually you're the, there's a bit of a time lead time to get the sample to them and get the result back. So something to keep in mind, your local compliance lab, the people in your town, it might be pretty expensive. Most of the reason for that is those laboratories are required to meet certain standards and licensing and pay certain fees, and that increases the cost. Why that I'm bringing this up in relation to coffee is that the things that we're looking for, like within the SCA water standards, don't really pertain to the sanitation of water. And especially at the ranges that we're looking at, it doesn't really affect human consumption. So your local municipality and most most generally people aren't concerned with those things. And so in in order to uh, test for, you know, in most of those compliance labs, when they run a, wa a water test, it's usually on a device that scans 100 different analytes. And we only want seven of them, but you're gonna pay for all 200 or 100 anyway. So there's some cost in that. So something to keep in mind when running uh, samples through a lab. If you find low cost labs online, be a little cautious. There are a lot of them, a lot of websites for companies that market products that will do free water testing. And they're really trying to target whatever it is that their product addresses. So they may sell a filter for iron and they'll say, oh, free water test, we'll, we'll test your water. You send them a sample, it may only cost a few dollars or it may be free, but you're gonna get basically a bunch of marketing back for whatever the product they sell. So just a caution, cautionary tale on that. Um, but uh, how often should you do it? Uh, we, we actually, La Marzocco, in addition to, you know, having a, you know, some inexpensive test strips that we sell or give away sometimes, uh, we have a, water, a small water lab that uses 
uh, a spectrophotometer, which just makes it a little bit easier and, and, and quicker and repeatable for us to test water. And we also do use a compliance lab in Ballard uh, to test samples against. And we do that several times a year just to keep an eye on that we're, you know, the processes that we're using, uh, make sure they, you know, our, our sample that we sample in-house aligns with the results that the compliance lab is getting because they're doing this, they have a little more, you know, uh, experience at it and fancier equipment than we do, and they can they can understand that process better. So I'd say for a technician in the field, you might do it once or twice uh, in a year. Uh, it helps to get a baseline to understand that if you're testing water routinely and you're recording those results, you know, measuring those results against a professional lab will tell you something. And I've done this a number of times with customers in the field where we've compared our dip strip uh water tests that we've done local analytical test and then all, also you know sometimes the filter manufacturer will also test the water and those all generally line up while you have less precision with the dip strips the accuracy or the general accuracy will line up with our test in-house as well as a compliance lab and then the second part of your is there another part of the question <laughs> sorry um working with your water provider to understand what to look for seasonally Oh, okay. So, and I, I'm going to take that to mean like working with your municipal water supplier. Uh, yep. And that's basically, you know, those those folks uh, do a great job and they're required to put out a water quality report. Uh, the minimum requirement isn't very high federally. It's only like every two years and really only if you find something in the water. Um, but but most, most municipalities do a pretty good job of it. Um, and those water quality reports should be available online. It's generally, I t when I go to look for something, I just type in the city and state, for the zip code, and I type in water quality report, and usually it's the top hit in Google. Uh, sometimes those water quality reports give us some great information, and other times they don't give us quite a, as much because, the, like I said, the things that we're looking for, things that affect coffee machines and extraction, uh, don't really affect human consumption. So they're not really top line concerns. However, most of those consumer confidence reports or water quality reports are generated by the same compliance lab that you would go to if you were taking a sample of water to. And as such, when they test the water, they're probably using gas chromatography mass spectrometer or GCMS. And that machine is going to scan for 200 or 300 analytes in water. And then the municipality is going to pick out from that report raw scan or report the things that they want they feel they need to report to the public on and what i found is that if you're really friendly with the local water department and you call up and you want to get that information like nine times out of ten i get that information a couple of things to note about dealing with the local local municipal water operator when you call up try to talk to somebody in the lab or the whoever the administrator is lead in with and this is important Lead in with, I really like the quality of my water. I like the way my water tastes. However, I have this espresso machine. And this is important because generally speaking, the only people who call the water department are people who don't like the taste of their water or think that the water made them sick. And if you get that off out of the way immediately, you will find great success in getting, in getting some of the results back that you're looking for, the information. And some of it can just be like, you know, hey, I have a question about water hardness and seasonality. Do you know if it changes or not? Because they're testing the water sometimes as often as every month. And so they're gonna have that seasonal information probably at hand or they can get it for you. Awesome. Um, pivot to a pretty specific one. I've got somebody here. Uh, Tim lives in Bath, United Kingdom and their water quality is um, currently reading out at 440 440 parts per million. Um, after going through a newly replaced filter, specifically a Brita Quell 1200, they're still left with about 190 to 240 ppm. Um, what's the solution here? Do we have to go full tilt to RO? Well, uh, it depends on what that 440 parts per million is, honestly. The TDS in itself just tells us a top line number. It's the sum of analytes. It doesn't tell us what the composition of that water is. And so it may be that the uh you're simply needing to adjust the bypass on the brita um or maybe the 
it, you need a second filter in line. It's going to depend on a number of things: the cost that you 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 know, how much you can put into this. The space that you have is also a consideration. Most cafes aren't very big; they don't have a lot of spare room. Um, and then uh, you know, uh, what where are you looking for this water to land on? Yeah, 190 parts per million is 100. Yeah. 190 parts per million is still pretty high in terms of TDS and whatever that is, it's probably a good idea to have a sense of what what that composition is. I do know that uh, uh, I've been working with uh, Gary Norwood at Brita in the UK and he's uh, uh, pretty well knowledgeable in this sort of stuff. And, and I would definitely say that reaching out to Brita in the UK uh, will probably yield some results on that and some solutions, so. Um. Another specific one, why use TDS over micro Siemens? Probably, if I'm saying that right. Oh, why, why use uh, TDS over EC? It's just a way of, of, of uh, representing uh, what you would expect to see in terms of parts per million if you were to add up, like if you were to titrate out the various components of total dissolved solids in your water. If you titrate out your hardness, your chloride, sulfate, alkalinity, iron, a few other things, um, the sum of those, as long as they are, as long as the titrate uh, solution that you're using returns results in parts per million as COCA3, the sum of those will equal roughly to 442 water calibration TDS or 0.7-ish. Uh, factor on your TDS meter. And if you do it, it, it doesn't change anything. Like the number, the actual TDS doesn't change if you go from EC to TDS. It's just a visual way of representing approximately what that sum is. So that, it's a, sort of complex. Um, it's a good nitty gritty one. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. Go, Scott. I was gonna say, it might be easier if we all just dealt with micro Siemens because that's like the actual return value you know, from the meter, and you're just basically the meter internally is just doing some some multiplication, but it it's the number we use. It's it's you know it it's the number you would you would want to use if you were trying to figure out if the other tests that you did uh, truly equal what's in the water, or if you missed something, or if you did, or if there's something else you need to test for. So it's a context thing. Um, um, hey, Clint, I wanted to throw something out there really fast to our uh, viewers. Yeah. Is we're currently planning season three, which will be another 10 season, 10, 10 episode season. If there's anything you'd like to see, please throw it in the questions so me and Clinton and the production team can get to can take a look at it. We'd be happy to try and accommodate you. So there you go. I'm done. For sure. Oh, good shout out. Um, Marty's got a good one. Uh, can you suggest a list of water analyzing tools every tech should carry in the truck? Yeah, you know, I've, uh, I have a couple of them and I've emailed them out a few times, but, you know, uh, mostly based upon, you know, TDS meters, um, some basic titrite, you know, kits. Um, so, uh, and then some options in there. So, um, some handheld uh, photometers that, that can work. Um, the biggest challenge with, with, with dip strips and titration as tools is they're fairly inexpensive per test and convenient. And as I've mentioned in past episodes, their one kind of drawback is their color metric. So you have to be able to see color. And I know that that's not a huge thing, but, but the last time I did a, a presentation in front of people uh, at an SCA event, and there was like 55 people there, I think two people raised their hand and said, oh, I can't see color. How am I going to do this test? So I just bring that up. Um, uh, so number, so TDS meter, pH meter, uh, titrite or uh, photometer kits for the water you're going to be dealing with, and not everyone's going to be dealing with the same thing. Just bear in mind that you know not everyone needs to check for chloride. Not everyone needs to even check for hardness. Um, but uh, understanding what it is, you know, getting a sense of where what testing you need to carry is probably the starting point. You can do that by reviewing the CCR for your, the areas where you service, um, and then you know at least carry a TDS meter and get a sense. So, yeah, uh, I can put together something on that, like a list of of options for each one of those segments, 
and, and get that out there as like a handout. That'd be awesome. Might be able to tack it onto this presentation depending on timing. Um, yeah. If not, we'll find a way to push it out through the, through the I'll link, for sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll link it up in the, I'll put it up in the Slack channel or something, so. Awesome. Um, question about temperatures of samples. Uh, we know that the meter compensates for the sample that you're testing to a certain degree. Um, should there be a concern if the water sample is frozen overnight and then thawed again by the time that we're testing for hardness, alkalinity, pH, et cetera? That's a good question. I, I have not actually explored that very well. Usually I think of, well, don't freeze the sample, but I think I've gotten back one frozen sample in the last couple of years and I just, I just went with it. Um, I do know that there's a concern or testing laboratories will tell you that there's a timing concern with getting water samples returned back um, uh, for certain, uh, certain results. The one that I've been told numerous times is that pH is the one that's the most volatile one. And to test that theory out, I used to send out water sample collection kits with a pH meter. So somebody could check the pH, record it on the bottle, sample bottle at the time of the sample and send it back. And then we would compare uh, if the results were really any different, you know, over the two weeks or so it would take to maybe get a sample back. And what I found was there really wasn't, in terms of what we're looking for, I didn't see much of a shift. Like it pretty much stayed the same. Um, you know, if you have water that has a fair amount of bicarbonate in it or alkalinity, it's going to keep the pH from shifting around a lot. Whereas if you had, you know, a, a sample of distilled water or something else, yeah, you, you know, very clean water, yeah, it's going to probably move around a bit more and you'll see some change. But I don't know how much of a concern that actually is. Um, Caleb has one kind of dear to my heart. Uh, have you seen a good use of RO waste? Slash reject water being captured and reused for other sources like sinks and toilets. Oh man, this is a big topic. So I was a plumber for five years, and I've actually dealt with the the reuse thing. I've actually tried to install some some re reuse water stuff in some some installations. And despite living in a very progressive part of the country, uh, the the water department and the plumbing inspectors are very conservative. Uh, the idea is that water only goes in one direction through the plumbing system and that's usually to the drain um i even even though i've used all listed components uh i've had it shut down um but there is some movement in this so to start with like in washington state where i'm located at it was actually illegal to reuse water until a few years ago like rain barrels were illegal um it all has to do with water rights and the idea that you are allowed to use that water once as it passes through your property and then you have to let it go because somebody else downstream from you has a right to use that water as well. I'm not exactly sure I follow the logic because one way or the other, the water is still going to go down the drain at some point after you use it. But, you know, that that is the, the way it was. Um, but, uh, yeah, so gray water would be would be one that the thing is is it's a sanitation issue like that water's been used and in what way how is it connected to your plumbing system is the most important thing because really what the plumbing department really wants as much isolation as possible so that in the you know in the worst case scenario there's really no way that that water can possibly get in and infect uh the water supply for anybody else so it's really about water safety and sanitation um i have seen some systems installed that that work uh, but so far, the um, the uh, what I've seen isn't terribly impressive. I mean, in terms of like the cost and the space required, it doesn't necessarily always work for a cafe. I think we're as technicians, we can play a part in this though, is that we can do a better job of understanding the installation side of an RO system, for instance, and building some efficiencies off of that. The smaller RO systems that we generally employ for cafes are not much different than what you can buy for your house, and that technology hasn't changed a lot in like 30, 40 years. It's gotten better. You know, membrane production has gotten more consistent, and membranes are more efficient. Uh, but we haven't always necessarily employed uh, uh, strategies and tactics to ensure that the system itself is running optimally as it should. 
and there's some some un things to understand about how RS systems work and how RS system specifications are laid out that are affected by the installation of the equipment and maintenance. That's a much broad, bigger topic, and there's a lot of moving parts to it. And I think it's something definitely we could tackle in an episode or a couple of episodes. Um, but it's certainly something we should explore because you know it, it's a it's a about water's a, an important resource. It costs money, and you know there's there's a knock-on effect. So yes, Highland. Um, Courtney Scherenberg was kind enough to post the Pentair testing stuff. So I just want to let everybody know that we will post it on Slack. Oh, awesome. Courtney's great. Thanks, Hi, Courtney. Courtney you rock. You're out there. Yeah. Thank you, um, Thank you then, so much. Um, uh, Charles, I, God, Charles Nick from, uh, from um, I think it's Third Wave, offered to answer any other questions about Third Wave Coffee if you'd like to. Oh, so, great. Awesome. Thank you. So we'll, we want to thank everybody for helping participate in this. Okay, I'm, I'm going dark again. All right. Okay. Um, Next one up, uh, Don Berquist brought up NACL 342. So we should talk about that a little bit and just calibrating your equipment in general, um, best practices, best routines kind of thing. Oh, okay. So NACL 342 is the calibration solution for TDS meters, uh, basically salinity meters. And I think I'm hopefully not misstating what he's asking here. Um, so TDS is a factor of EC. So basically you take your electric conductivity in micro Siemens and you, whether you multiply it by point X or divide by whatever, you arrive at a number that generally represents uh, total dissolved solids. If you were to actually manually titrate all of those components, they should, the sum of which would equal that number. Um, an ACL 342 is, is the calibration solution you'd use to recalibrate the meter to. It's just a, a pre-set solution that you know you drop your meter into, hit a button, the meter recalibrates, and kind of re-zeros to that number. Um, and but it's it's actually for salinity. And generally from the SCA standpoint and the uh, manufacturer standpoint, uh, we're using um, what's called 442. It's a different calibration solution. It was developed by a company called Myron L, which develops brand markets, sells uh, testing equipment, TDS meters. Um, and it better represents as a calibration solution, the composition of freshwater analytes that you're more likely to encounter in, in, in municipal water. So either way, just make sure that you are calibrating and that you're yeah. paying attention to how often you are. Yeah, exactly. Follow the manufacturer's recommendations with your meter. Um, you know, make sure you have, you know, keep replenishing your your uh, your uh, testing solution or calibration solution, and understand how that works. Um, there are several different types of meters, uh, and I know we've brought this up in the past. The first being, you know, EC salinity meters, basically analog NACL meters that you can, you know, they have a fixed point uh, that you can set it to, and you really can't adjust that. The second would be selectable meters that have multiple uh, TDS set points. You can kind of go between, usually between 0.5 and 0.7, like the uh, HM Digital COM 100 or COM 80 meters. Um, and then there are adjustable uh, factorization meters, which you can kind of go anywhere from like 0.4 to, to 1. And you can actually fine tune the meter uh, a little bit more to what you're testing. So um, a little more technical there. Technical is good. That's what we're here for. I lost where I was. Hold on just a second. Um, oh, setting up quality assurance programs uh, for predicting water conditioning components that need to be changed out. So kind of being able to map out how long a filter is going to last. Um, any strategies for that? Yeah, I can, you know, my origin story in water, I think, is a strategy for that, which was, you know, I worked for Starbucks Coffee Company's retail store development it's for 16 years. And and we, you know, had, you know, once once our company, you know, spread out beyond the Seattle market, like like many people from Seattle, we realized that, oh, we had great water and now wherever we are now, we don't. And and I moved out to Spokane, Washington and immediately knew we needed to do something about water. So we, we purchased a bunch of RO systems or nanofiltration systems actually for most of them. 
and and it worked great initially but the maintenance part we didn't really get we didn't get any heads up on like hey here's how you maintenance these systems here's how you strategize to make sure they keep working so what i ended up doing was hiring a third this is the expensive way to do it but i ended up hiring a third party company to go in and change filters and test water every month and i did that for like almost two years that was really expensive but it gave me a a lot of information about the performance of those filters you know and and what the water quality looked like and and what the effect it was having on 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 repair and maintenance i saw you know reactive service calls drop dramatically so uh, a lot less uh, field work being done need, needing to be done because everything is being maintained and because i was getting reports every month about what was happening with the system i was getting both before and after, you know, here's what the water looks like at the site, and here's what we're doing to remediate whatever problems we're finding. Um, I was able to get a baseline over a period of time. And so testing more often and recording and reviewing that uh, will give you a lot of information right there about what you need to do. So that's why I emphasize that is probably the top line most important thing for technicians to do is to be able to test and understand the water that they're dealing with. And then from there, understanding whether the the solutions that we've employed are having the desired effect that we hope for. Does that kind of help you? Does that kind of answer yeah, the question? That's, that's awesome. And then what? And once you start doing that, the thing is, is that you can then kind of pull, you may be able to pull back in some areas. So in my case, I had like 70 stores uh, or it got to 70 stores. And over the course of several years of, of doing this kind of quality analysis on our water, we're able to identify, well, some stores, you know, we don't need to change the filter as often because the water seems pretty stable. It doesn't change. It's actually not as bad as we thought it was. Uh, we still test it occasionally and keep an eye on it. And we test it every time we're there for a reactive call. But, you know, we were able to pull back. And in some situations, we actually had to, we didn't necessarily need to change the filters more, but we know we knew that those areas could be problems if we didn't keep an eye on it. So, yeah, it's just a matter of gaining, getting more information. Yes. Hey, gentlemen, we're coming to our time and we still gotcha. have a lot of questions. So I'm going to propose yeah. we go over a little bit if you guys are amenable to it. Yeah, I'm fine. I've got time. Are you okay yeah. with that? Okay, yeah. cool. Let's go till 10 after so we can get all the questions. And for our viewers, we will get copies of your questions and Scott, myself, and Clint will do our best to answer them for stuff that we don't address. Thanks, you guys. Yeah. Okay. Um, good chance to hammer home something that we kind of we keep touching on but it's good to get the full view when we were talking about the analytes that um municipal water supply will have that huge list of 100 you said there were seven specific ones we care about for coffee yeah. um what are the seven analytes what are their desired levels and um i'm pretty sure that there's tables listed in a few spots of those where's the um where would you recommend people go for that quick reference on those seven analytes yeah, six or seven. I, I may have spitballed it there, but either way, uh, basically what I was referencing was the SCA's water quality standards and the water quality handbook, which I think some of that information is available online freely and the rest of it, the more in-depth stuff, I think you got to pay for it, but it's it's worth it. I've gotten a copy myself and I can I would say you know everyone should, should get into that as a starting point. You can also get some of this information uh, and most of it generally lines up across the coffee industry between both roasters and manufacturers. Uh, generally speaking, most of the numbers fall within pretty similar numbers. Um, at La Marzocco, of course, we have a, a standards on our page. If you go to lamarzoccousa.com under the support tab, under water uh, water specifications, we list both uh, in a table what we look for in water, as well as we have a water calculator. And I know a couple other manufacturers do too, so I, I don't know their all, all their addresses and that uh, they're uh, online, but they're out there as well. So there's a number of tools that you can employ. Um, the other, uh, there's a number of websites as well that have information on this to help you understand both testing and to interpret the results. Um, one that I find really helpful is Lintech. Uh, I believe they're in the Netherlands. I'm super bad with geography, uh, but uh, they've got a website with a lot of online calculators and information on there for uh, addressing or understanding your water. Um, but uh, in terms of that, we're primarily looking at total dissolved solids as your top line number, total hardness, alkalinity. Iron is usually in there. One note about iron, if you have an iron problem, you don't need to test for it. You know you have an iron problem because it stains your sinks. Iron is pernicious. It's very hard to get rid of. So if you have it at all, you're going to know it. 
um, then we're looking usually at chlorine and free chlorine, which is your disinfectants, and possibly chloramines, which is com combined disinfectants. Um, pH, and usually chlorides, and sometimes sulfates and silica as well. So um, sulfates, although they can create corrosive issues in, in boilers, they generally happen at much higher concentrations than, say, chlorides do, and under slightly different uh, water conditions. So less of a problem, but I have seen it once or twice. Uh, silica, which is basically like, you know, what makes up glass and sand. When that stuff builds up in your boiler, that stuff's really hard, hard to get out. Ask Marty Rowe about that. I think he has a story or two about silica in, in coffee boilers. That's some good pictures. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, and so those are the primary things that we're looking at because everything else that you is going to be covered in one of those CCRs is usually dealing with a bunch of stuff that's possibly toxic or, you know, trihalomethanes or hexavalent chromium, you know, byproducts of this, which are byproducts of disinfectant. Um, and they're just looking to see that the, when they're treating the waters, they're not creating more problems down the line. But, um, but yeah, uh, those, are the, those are the primary things. I would also add in there sodium. So if you have a CCR that has a, does not list chloride, but it lists sodium, you can calculate out the chloride because it's it's the most dominant chemical compound in, in, in water is sodium chloride. So if you know the sodium number by mass, you can understand what the chloride concentration is by mass. It's just some math. So, yeah. Um, is there a bottled water for home espresso machines that you'd recommend for residential customers? Yeah, generally we recommend uh, Poland Springs and... Uh, uh, Crystal Geyser. It sort of depends a little bit on where it's bottled because those are national brands now and they might use more than one bottling uh, place, but you can look that information up on their website. Um, I've had people, I had somebody call me yesterday actually, uh, a technician called me about a customer, I think it was in a home, but it might have been an office, and they were using BG bottled water, which is pretty hard water and no wonder it took only a couple months to scale up their machine. Um, but if you if you don't have particular bottled water that meets the all the parameters for coffee if you got one that's a little bit hard or a little bit high in TDS you can buy some distilled water and dilute it and that works really well um, let's talk a little bit about the reliability and stability of reverse osmosis systems um, what does it take to keep them in that golden, reliable, and stable range? Well, going back to that question about water reusage and gray water usage and, and water efficiency, the primary thing that we should focus on with RO systems, in addition to just having regular maintenance and checking on it, and knowing how to check the performance of the RO system, we should be looking at the installation. So we're looking at water pressure, and uh, water temperature and water quality going into it. Temperature is not one that we really um, generally address in the kind of light commercial setting that we're talking about. I know Pentair has a solution or they have tried some solutions to moderate water, feed water temperatures to RO systems, um, but just know that that adds some complexity where you may not have, you may not be have enough flexibility in your plumbing installation for that. Um, but uh, and that has to do with the fact that RO membrane production specifications are based upon, or generally based upon, uh, laboratory grade water temperature, which is 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So when you see a, a membrane or an RO system that says produces 100 gallons a day, it only produces 100 gallons a day at, at X pressure and 77 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 degrees C. And if you deviate from that temperature, you're going to deviate in production, either both the volume of water produced or the quality of the water produced, and you may need to account for that. Generally, how we account for that in the installation is to adjust the in incoming or driven pressure, net driven pressure across the membrane. One other thing to note about RO systems and any filtration system, they're all building blocks to a solution. We, we always have some kind of coarse filter to trap any sort of sediments or suspended uh, colloidals in water. We have a carbon block to take care of disinfectants. That's the building block, the basis. Every cafe is gonna have that. From there, depending on what else you're going to be dealing with, it may include a water softener, some form of ion exchange, 
uh, and possibly an RO system and some sort of post filter to correct that water. So an RO is really just kind of sitting in the middle of possibly a solution. So if you're dealing with efficiencies, you may look at if I've only got a you know a pre-filter and an RO membrane and that's it. If I'm trying to build efficiency, maybe my water is too hard for that RO. I need to soften it or pre-treat it first. That will make the RO more efficient and produce more water and waste less. So just something to keep in mind there that most of this is addressed at the installation and then ongoing you know monitoring. Awesome. Um, nitty gritty one, the relation between permanent hardness and low pH. So permanent hardness, meaning calcium compounds in water that are bound up with uh, chloride, like cal calcium chloride, uh, don't precipitate out in water when heated. That stays bound to the, uh, basically stays in the water, so to speak. The challenge here is that when you have, you introduce chloride into your water, it, you know, just like sodium chloride, it doesn't stay as a compound. These things separate out and become ion, free ions in water. And as such, they can be active and react with things in the environment around them, like your stainless steel boiler. Specifically with this chloride is that it can get into small crevices and pits. And then if you have a low pH situation or the potential for low pH, that you can create a micro environment within that pit that reacts with the ferric iron at I think if I have got this right at the grain boundary, and it creates an autocatalytic reaction, basically like a cancer in the metal. And there really is no way to stop it. It will continue to work its way through, even if you were to flush the boiler out. Uh, you know, there's, you know, you pretty much it's oh, toast at that point. Yeah, it's not reliable anymore. So the best bet is to avoid getting chloride into your water at all, because even if you've had success in the past with the strategy, chances are it's going to fail at some point because your water is likely to change. So. Um. Hey, Scott, one of the questions I, I wanted to cover this um, about what's the future looking like with everything that we're seeing and water tables are changing. What can we expect to see more of? What can we expect to see? Oh, I think we're going to see a lot of, of stress on our water systems, like you're seeing in Southern California. Um, you know, I, I do work a lot with, lately, a lot with customers in Southern California, and those each city is buying water and moving water around uh, to try to maintain, you know, level of service. And as such, the water quality varies. You know, I I talked to our sales director, or VP of sales, Mike Lands, who lives in Los Angeles, and he tells me the water quality can change almost every day. Uh, it can be pretty rapid. So as we see, you know, uh, greater increase in the load on our water systems, um, we're going to see a lot more regulation about how we use water and how efficiently we use water. So I think that's going to play a part into um, kind of the future of, of um of what that means for cafes and water usage. And I can say this, technicians, we're gonna be on the forefront of that. We're gonna be one of the, you know, we're gonna be the people providing that solution. And so getting out ahead of that and understanding, you know, having an understanding of where that's going uh, is, is an important part of that. You know, we as technicians, uh, we play a vital role in the efficiency and the environment of how or how coffee as an industry and as a whole affects the, in the environment, right? If we're careful about, um, you know, keeping up on maintenance on our grinder, we know we have better consistency on our dial-in, we waste less coffee at dial-in, and, and, and the coffee tastes better, and that's what people want, because we want to have tasty coffee, that, that's why I'm here. And um, so if we as technicians take care of the equipment and keep it running in peak performance, we waste less coffee. Wasting less coffee means we, have to, we don't need as much land or resources to grow more coffee for that kind of cost of quality that tends to be built into the coffee that we consume, so. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. And a uh, good final one here, actually. Uh, Marty heard us say that we were going to extend a little bit and came up with a couple more questions for us. Thanks, um, Marty. Uh, good practice for dealing with the water and coffee equipment in the event of a temporary store shutdown. And a second one here. Um, in Texas right now, there's a boil order, um, and it does happen times other than these. Uh, does the 200-plus degree Fahrenheit water sterilize what's going on there or is there something else that needs to happen to protect equipment and coffee in the event of a boil order 
boy, you know, I am not a microbiologist and I'm certainly not a doctor, so I don't want to substitute that information. Um, I think that, you know, most bacteria, obviously, unless you're talking about, uh, you know, hide, uh, what's it called, uh, pyrophilic bacteria, which doesn't really generally exist at surface level, um, you're not going to encounter that. Um, does it sterilize efficiently? I don't know. Uh, one of the challenges, and this came up on the Slack channel that I answered just before this, uh, uh, was uh, a question of, well, if I can't boil water, will an RO sufficiently sterilize my water? And the answer is probably no. And the reason for that is that an RO system is a non-selective way of removing total dissolved solids from water. So yeah, it does remove bacteria, but it doesn't remove like exotoxin that's produced by the bacteria. That behaves more like a gas and can pass through that membrane. That's really not designed for it. So that's a couple things to keep in mind. I mean, you, it, it would be better than nothing if that's all you had and you had power to, or, or a way to drive the pressure across the membrane efficiently. efficiently it would it, be better than nothing. Uh, but actually, from a from a uh, practical standpoint, uh, in that situation, uh, and I posted a link to this in the Slack channel. You know, if you have some access to some common household bleach and some buckets, uh, and even using something like some, you know, a, a t-shirt folded over several times to pass the water through to bring out any coal oils or suspended solids, that would probably be the uh, the uh, the better approach in this situation. Unfortunately. I would I would say that going forward in dealing with disaster relief, there's a product called Procter and Gamble Purifier of Water. It's small packets that purify two gallons of water at a time. It's a combination of a flocculant and disinfectant, and you can take dirty pond water and filter it out. And within I don't know ten minutes, it's it's clear and and clean enough for human consumption. Uh, you know, and it's inexpensive. You know, you can buy like a, buy the case on Amazon. Uh, and you and it just comes in tiny little packets. Um, if you don't follow Mark Rober on YouTube, he's a, a, a former JPL engineer. He does a whole episode last year on on this PNG solution. It's really, really quite amazing uh, how well it works. So no, I'd say no on the RO. And whether or not you know running an espresso machine long enough to boil it uh, should kill the bacteria. Whether or not though we don't know what it is you're dealing with and there could be toxins in there. So best to flush everything out. Um, and then dealing with the equipment in the event of a temporary store shutdown. Oh yeah, I didn't cover that. We we put out a document and it is online for La Marzocco at least. And I, I think it would equally apply to any other piece of equipment out there that we recommend, uh, you know, disconnecting from power, disconnecting from plumbing and draining the equipment down is, is probably the best thing. Ideally, you know, uh, it would be, excuse me, it would be best if it could be in a, you know, uh, environmentally, you know, stable, you know, and temperature and controlled environment. You know, that's not always like possible in this situation, but at least draining the, the boilers and specifically your coffee boiler and your coffee tubing. Uh, steam boilers I found can be frozen. I've unfortunately done that a few times. Anything that's hydraulic that has no air gap or headspace. Uh, water is is absolutely amazing at destroying stainless steel. Uh, I say this from from uh, rather expensive uh, encounters. So, and something I will add on to that: whether you are a member of the Tech Guild or not, um, if you go to the Technicians Guild website and uh, search for, it was posted on April twenty eighth. Um, the guild actually put together an extended storage procedure checklist awesome. um, that is actually a pretty uh, intensive guide to what to do. And that covers, I believe, um, filtration and things like that as well, because I think sometimes people forget the cartridge filter and then you fire it up after three months of sitting with stagnant water and you didn't really do yourself any favors there in the end. Something else to include, you got um, viewers on the, on the Guild webpage um, in, in our blog that we produce. Scott Manley has a series of incredibly useful water articles that I cannot recommend enough that give you a lot of really basic stuff that we've gone over too. Well, cool. this is coming up to 1210. So I think it is, uh, well, 1210 my time. Um, so I think it is time to wrap this one up. Uh, if we did not answer your question, we will make sure to get a hold of you. Uh, thankfully, your email is logged um, 
along with your name when you ask a question so we can get back to you directly and whatever we can we will also answer publicly to make sure those answers are out there but uh thank you everybody for attending thank you scott for sharing so much knowledge with us again and again it's been wonderful and uh thank you to the tech guild in general and the sba for the opportunity to keep having these conversations Absolutely. Thanks, uh, Clinton. Thanks, Highland, for uh, for hosting this. Uh, thank you to the SCA. Um, thank you to my employer, La Marzocco, uh, for my brothers and sisters in Greece. If I still pull E. Um, <laughs> you forgot Stelios's question, so I'll email it. Um, thanks both to you and your organizations, La Marzocco and Clinton, your business, Connected Coffee Solutions, for taking the time out to work with our viewers and answer questions. We really appreciate it. And then don't forget to plug Marty for next week. Right. Yes, uh, next week it is, um, what were we discussing again? I had my note there. Um, Marty will be doing why tech, tech you should, should know coffee. about coffee. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, definitely tune in for that, guys. That's going to be great. That's going to be a fun one. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Everybody All have right. a great weekend. Take care.